Hello and welcome. So this is the first of the Developer Essentials videos. So the focus of this one is going to be getting our tools set up and up and running and also getting a little bit of an initial look at those. So understanding what they can do, where to find particular things in them, and we're going to be setting up a, a really, really basic environment there in the project. And that's really the focus. By the end of this is to have you with the tools installed and a bit of an understanding of where to find the things that you need in them. So this is going to be the, the last little bit where I'm taking up most of the screen. Uh, and it's it's time for me to, to, to shrink down to a, a smaller version. Um, so for most of the time, I'm going to be down here. Uh, but there will be, at times, there's going to be information that needs to be shown here. So in those cases, I'm going to be uh, appearing up in the corner up here. Uh, but I'm going to return back to my spot uh, down below. Uh, and so I'll be talking to you from here. So as you might be able to guess from the page that I'm currently on, uh, Unity is going to be the main tool that we're going to be looking at. And that's going to be for a number of reasons. Now, you know, there, there are a lot of different game engines out there, and in particular, there's a lot of different ones that are free for you to be using, uh, which is great. And they're free generally, you know, a lot of the licenses, it's free up until you're earning a certain amount. Um, and so they're, they're really great to get set up with. And I've used Unreal, I've used custom engines, and I've used Unity. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why I'm recommending Unity. I think it's a really good starting one. Um, it's lighter weight, so it runs on a lot more devices. So, like I use Unity on uh, my MacBook, and it's not super high spec, but I can develop a lot of games on that, which makes it really, really easy, really portable. Um, Unreal, I find, doesn't run as well on that. It does tend to need a bit more in the way of resources, but there isn't any one right engine. There isn't one universal right. This is the engine that every team should use for every game. And if anyone tells you that, they're kind of talking nonsense. You, you, the best engine to use depends on the project and depends on the team. And when you're getting started, what matters is not less the actual, you know, that you're learning one specific engine. What matters is that you're learning any engine because the skills that you learn from one can transfer over to another. You know, the engines do a lot of very similar things and in similar ways, but the names of things might change. So don't get too hung up on, okay, we have to learn this one specific engine or we always have to use this particular thing for projects. You don't. So we're gonna take a look at Unity. Now I'm going to chuck the links to these things in the comments below. Um, I'm also going to uh, put those links up on the screen with a little uh, scannable code as well if you want, uh, just to make it easy to go and grab those tools. So if you go to the main Unity page, you know, from here we can go to get started. And it's defaulting to the team section, but we actually want to click over to individual. And in most cases, the one that we're going to want is personal. And we can see here, it's talking through, you know, okay, if your revenue or funding is less than 100K, then the personal one is the ones that, one that you want to go for. And, you know, if you get to the point where you're making more than 100K from the stuff, that's a, that's the, the license costs are really not going to be a big concern then at that point. So if we go to get started, then you know you can walk through the the initial sort of guide there or we can just go direct to where we can download and so what this will download it you know again runs through the particular terms there um, so it's also indicating stuff like you haven't raised funds in excess of a certain amount so if folks are going through kickstarter stuff like of that uh, that's something where you want to make sure you're uh, taking that into account as well for it uh, and so from here, you can then download this thing called Unity Hub. So Unity Hub is the main way that I would recommend for accessing the Unity, because um, what it lets you do is, and that's trying to uh, give me some helpful options there. Uh, Unity Hub, once you've got it installed, you can easily add in your versions here and you can have multiple versions. Um, you don't often need multiple versions, but because I develop 
tools for Unity as well. I often want to test those in different versions. So that's where I actually will go and use uh, and have multiple different ones installed. Now I've already got ones installed here and if I wanted to add in extra ones or if you're you know, your first time you, you're launching the hub, this will be empty. And so you can go add and it lists different ones. So it gives you, you know, recommended ones. And so you might see this notation LTS. LTS means long-term support. Uh, so that's ones where it's going to be you know, much more stable. There's not going to be major changes happening to it. They're still getting bug fixes. So LTS versions, that long-term support, they get bug fixes for a much longer period. Uh, so generally what I recommend is you, know, you could, I, the reason it's not showing uh, newer versions in this is because I've already got them installed. Uh, I usually would recommend, especially for starting out, just stick with the latest version. But if you're working on a large project, there will be a point where you version lock. So you'll get the latest version, you might continue to upgrade as you get new versions coming out, but you generally will version lock. But I'll show you what you see when we've selected one. When we go next, we get these different modules we can add in. And so what these modules relate to is what platforms, what devices do you want your project to be able to run on? So if I wanted to release the project on Android, I would add in the Android build support. If I wanted to release on iOS, I would add in iOS build support. So these different ones allow me to release the project on different platforms and different devices. For, the, for a lot of the initial development that you'd be doing, what I would recommend is I usually go for the, the trio of Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, I think is a, is a good sort of initial set of ones. And then if you're looking at developing for different platforms, you could add in things like WebGL, you could add in things like iOS, um, so depending upon what you're looking at releasing for. Uh, and once you've done that, you can then hit done and that will bring in those particular files. It will download everything you need there. Uh, once it's downloaded, you can also modify it if you need. So I can pick one of these and the three dots. So I can click on that and go add modules. So I can add particular ones in there if I need to. So if there's ones where I uh, haven't added it in at the initial starting point, I can then go and add that in afterwards. Now, that's one set of tools. There's another tool that I really recommend using because one of the things we'll be doing is we'll be editing code. And there are a lot of uh, tools for doing that. They're called Integrated Development Environments or IDEs. Uh, so the main one that I recommend is one called Visual Studio Code. Uh, it's a freely available one. It runs on everything. And because I, the reason I use it is I do a lot of switching between Windows and Mac and developing on both at the you know, sort of same time on the same projects. So Visual Studio Code, I can have all of my add-ons, all of my settings synchronized between the two platforms. So that's the reason I go for Visual Studio Code. It makes it much easier for me keeping it coordinated like that. It's also really lightweight. Uh, which is a thing I really like. It's very, very minimal in terms of install. But there are other IDEs you can use as well. So you can use stuff like uh, the four versions of Visual Studio. There's ones there that are freely available that folks can use. But let's assume we've got everything installed. Now we need to create a project. So I'm going to go to the new button here. And we can see we've got different options there. The, arrow, the drop down there lets us select which Unity version. If I don't use that drop down and select one, it by default creates one for the latest Unity that you have installed. So I'm going to go new. And then we have these templates. So these templates are kind of the, the, the building blocks uh, that you want to have in there from the, the get go. And we've got a few different options here. And we can see there's a couple of ones that I don't have installed yet. So I don't have things like the mobile 2D, 3D, AR or VR ones installed, um, but I could download those. So if I was creating a project that was based in those, I could do that. Now 2D or 3D, those 
there's a thing that it's not saying with this. So you can see with, uh, we've got ones here that say high definition RP. RP stands for render pipeline. And we have universal render pipeline. So these 2D and 3D ones are using something called the built-in pipeline. So in Unity, there are three pipelines, built-in, high definition, and universal. And what those pipelines refer to is how graphics get drawn. So they are different approaches for doing that. So they, they cover a range of different areas. So Universal kind of started more targeted towards the mobile side. And so Universal focuses more on really solid performance on everything. So whether it's a lower spec device or a high spec device that you're getting really good performance on all on those. Um, so it can be a good option for things like mobile, it can be a good option for things like really lightweight VR projects. Um, then we've got the high def pipeline. Now the high def pipeline is when you're really wanting high visual fidelity. So high def pipeline is when you're wanting stuff where you've got really detailed think lighting, and shadows, visual effects. Um, it's a bit all about visual fidelity uh, with the high def pipeline and workflows that sort of prioritize and simplify the process of doing that. Then the built-in pipeline, that's actually the original pipeline. And most of the stuff we're doing, we're going to be using the built-in pipeline there. Uh, built-in pipeline is kind of sits in the middle. So you can use it for your know, high-end stuff, but it might be a bit more work involved in that. And you can use it also for low-end devices. But again, it might be a bit more work. So it sits in the middle ground and it can move to either side, but it just it tends to be a little bit more work. Uh, if you're trying to really push that visual fidelity or you're trying to really push uh, super high performance. Uh, so they're different pipelines. They have different, different functionalities, different sort of areas they're prioritizing. So which pipeline you use depends on the project that you're doing. For the ones that we're doing, we're going to stick with the built-in pipeline for now. Now, in terms of 2D or 3D, it really doesn't matter. You can take a 2D game and switch it to 3D in about 30 seconds. You can take a 3D game and switch it to a 2D in about 30 seconds. The only thing that's really changing there is camera settings. That's all it actually changes, so there's very little there. Um, the one game could be switching between 2D and 3D camera modes all the time, or using both simultaneously you know, for doing various effects. So it's something to not get too hung up on. But I'm gonna have that be a 3D one, and this is going to get a name. So this is going to be uh, Developer Essentials. And this is our getting started one. Uh, and important to mention that this project, all of the projects that create in these videos will be available and you can find the link to where the, the completed projects are in the comments below. So now it's going to take a little bit to create the project. Uh, so this, the amount of time this takes can, can vary a little bit because it's getting initial stuff set up. Um, but this is a, a good point in time to run through, pause and run through sort of the remaining bits we're going to take a look at. So once we've got this up and running, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at, okay, what are the different pieces that we see there in the Unity editor? So looking at how do we actually work with uh, assets, so the things that are going into our game, how do we organize stuff into our levels in the game, and also how do we do some basic changes there? So we're not going to be working with any code yet, but we're going to be taking a look at just those and this is still important so we're actually going to uh, do some video magic uh, and nope we don't need to do video magic I thought I was going to need to do a, a little bit of a cut there turns out no um, but uh, while I could remove the, this in the edit I'm going to leave it in all right so this is generally what we're going to see. Now, the organization of our screen here is something referred to as the layout. Now, your layout might look a little bit different. 
And sometimes you can get, you need to reset the layout. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So if I go to window and under layouts, and then I can go to default. And that just resets everything. So I can see the, the default of how things look there. Um, so yours should look fairly similar to this. So let's look at the different things that we've got. Um, and we've got a lot of different areas here. So the first thing we're gonna look down the bottom left here, we've got this project section. And we've also got console. But let's focus on project for now. So project, we can see we've got assets and packages and assets is the one we're concerned about. This is all of the files, the information there to make up our project. So it has all of the files for our levels, it might have our audio, it might have our models, uh, all, our code, all of the different bits and pieces there. So this is something where this corresponds directly to a folder on our computer. So we can take a look and we can see, okay, we've got assets and we can see we have these scenes folders. Now we have these meta files. Uh, those meta files are important. They contain a little bit of information and you'll see for every, every asset here, there will always be a meta file. What that meta file has is just a little bit of information and it usually has as a minimum, a unique identifier. So it has a little a, a string of numbers that, and letters that uniquely identify that folder or that file so that everything in the project just refers to that little uh, set of uh, numbers. It also might have some extra settings of, okay, how do we import this into the game? Now, important thing, if you're reorganizing these folders, so if I wanted to rename you know, these folders or move things around, do that moving in here in this projects view. So I could be setting up another folder here for materials. Uh, for example, I could also set up a folder for scripts. So for my code, but doing all of this setup, doing moving of those, do that within Unity. Because if we take a look, so my assets folder, can see I've got the scripts one. If I just moved the scripts folder now, its meta file wouldn't move, which would potentially cause problems. But not that this is a good thing to do, but if I moved, say, my scripts folder under scenes, what I can see is it's moved it. So always do any moving of files, folders, any renaming of them within Unity. It will make sure it's preserving the, the links between uh, all of your files correctly then. So all of that happens within Unity. So assets, we can create things in here. So if we go to create, you know, we have a lot of different ones that we can be creating and these are all of our different types of assets. So when we're talking about an asset, an asset is any, any sort of building block for the game. It might be code to perform a particular task. It might be a file that contains our level, so storing where everything is. It might be you know, different 3D objects, different 2D objects, different audio files, animations, all different things. Those are our assets. Our assets are our building blocks that we piece together to make our actual game. Now where those assets go is in this thing called a scene. So we can see here we've got our hierarchy. So Unity uses the term scene, but a term that people might be more familiar with is level. That's actually what a scene is. A scene is a level, or it might be a part of a level. Now for the stuff that we're doing, for most of the time, we're just going to be working in the one scene because we don't, you know, there's only one of us working on it and it's fairly simple. But if you've got a very large project, then you don't want multiple people working in the one scene because that if one person's making changes, that often means other people can't. So what will happen is on a large project, we will take that scene or that level and we split it up into chunks. So we might have one chunk that just has the kind of the, the big geometry. So what we're talking about there is things like our floors, our walls, ceilings, big, big things that are not moving. We might have another level that has just the things that we can interact with in it. 
You might have another level that just has the player or the you know, AI characters in it. So we split it up so that we can have multiple people work at the same time. So we can split it into horizontal layers or we can split it vertically. Uh, as well. So we can do both splits at the same time. So when we're splitting vertically, we can take just a segment of a level. So it might be a case of you go into a, a building and then you can't see out of that building, say, well, we don't need to keep everything outside of the building loaded. We can actually unload it. So we're using less memory. We're using less resources. So we can split our levels up horizontally based on their, their function, their purpose, or vertically based upon where the player is and what things the player can actually see. And so we can do either one of those or we can do both. So in large games, it's not unusual that you might have, rather than you know, something that is presented as you're in, you're in this level, you're actually in something that might be comprised of 50 to 100, sometimes even more separate layers. Um, but Unity's version of that is called a scene, and you can have multiple scenes loaded at the same time. Uh, so Unity calls it a scene, and the hierarchy represents that scene. And we can see at the moment in the hierarchy, we have a camera and we have a light. We could add in extra things to this. So if I right click in the scene, then I can come here and I can go down to 3D object and I could add in a cube and it'll appear there in front of me. And we can name stuff. Now, it's really important, the naming of things. And I can't underscore enough just how critical it is to get into good habits with that early on. Resist the urge to just be like, yep, I'm just gonna create all the things here and they'll just be whatever the default name is. Please, I really recommend don't do that. Go through and as you add stuff in, name it based upon what it actually is. It's going to make finding stuff easier later on because your scenes, when you start to get to moderate to large size games, you can have hundreds of things there in the hierarchy. And yeah, you can search for things and that searching is great if the things have names that make sense, that you can find them. So get into good practices with naming stuff early on. It will save you time down the track. And the earlier you get into that habit, the better. It's going to make life a lot easier for you. Um, so hierarchy, we can organize things and you know, it's called a hierarchy and we can have things that are parents of other things. And we'll start to have a bit of a look at what how that works. Because if I click on the cube, then one of the things we notice is clicking on the cube, this thing called the inspector populates. And if I click on different things here, the inspector populates with different stuff. And so the inspector allows us to customize what we have selected, it allows us to change the different aspects of it. And we can see these different things here that can be collapsed. We've got our transform, we've got our mesh filter with the cube, a mesh renderer. We can see that on the directional light, we also have a transform and a light. On the main camera, we have a transform, a camera and an audio listener. So all of these things have a transform and then other things attached to it. If we create a completely empty thing, we can see it just has a transform. So the building block of things in the scene in Unity is something called a game object. A game object has a location in the world. It also has a rotation. So location is its position, so we can change its position. Um, so this is just moving the empty game object. So we can see the axes there. I can also rotate it. I can also change the scale of it. Now we won't see any actual difference happen there because it's an empty game object. But if I went to the cube and changed the scale, then we can see that actually updates. So a game object is something that is anchored in the world. And then what we can do is onto that game object, we attach components. So cube mesh filter is a component. A mesh renderer is a component. Box collider is a component, same as on the line. So these components add in 
extra functionality. They make it that that object does different things. So the game object is like a set of, set of foundations that has lots of little slots that we can plug things into. We can plug in as many different components. And what it means is the only difference between our cube and our directional light and our camera is the components that are attached. And I could actually combine these. I could make it that my directional light is also my camera just by migrating the components over. Or I could combine all of it. So I just have one component that it's the cube, it's the camera to render the world, and it's also the light. So you can combine these different things. So we, the way we add capabilities, the way we add functionality to a game object is through adding components. So components add in extra capabilities. But let's take a look a bit more at this idea of being able to position things in the world. So you know, one of the fundamental things we often need to be doing is laying stuff out in the world. So our cube, we have up the top here, different controls to allow us to manipulate stuff. So we're currently on the translation one, which what that lets us do is if I grab one of the axes, then I can move just along that. You'll see between the axes, there are these colored planes. And so those, so if I pick one of those, then I am moving it just on that plane. I can pick any one of those. And so if we look in the inspector, we can see I'm moving it around and the Y value is never changing. If I pick this plane and I'm moving it around, the X is never changing. And then this one, the Z is never changing. So we can easily translate the object in the world. We can also just rotate it manually in this. So we switch to rotation mode and again, I've got my different ones. I can select this to just rotate it about one axis and we can see on the Y rotation there is changing. I can select the blue one just to be changing that rotation or the red one. So we have different ways of changing that. We can also be adjusting the scale. And if I click on the box in the center, that scales everything. So we can see they're all changing. But if I just want to change in one axis, I can do that. I can change in another. So we can make this all manner of different uh, sizes there and translate it and rotate it. And if we get any of these, we're not happy with it. We want to reset it. Then we can click on the three dots here in the transform and we can go to reset or we can go reset property if we wanted to just reset one of them. So the main reset will reset everything. So it all goes back to zero position, zero rotation, and the scale set to one. Uh, but I could have just reset one of those if I wanted to. So, okay, we can position stuff and you can switch between these different modes with keys. So W is translation, E is rotation, R is scale. Uh, and we do have other modes that we can adjust here as well. But I was saying that you know, this thing is a hierarchy and that you know, has meaning. And so let's see what that actual meaning is. So if I come here and I click and go and I want to create an empty object. And so this, I'm going to refer to this as the cube anchor. So the cube anchor is at all zeros in position and rotation. And now I'm going to move the cube under this. And what I'm specifically going to do is I'm going to move the cube up a couple of meters. So the default units in unity are meters. So I've moved it a couple of meters up. So the cube is, the anchor is still at zero, 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 but the cube is at two meters up in the air from that. So let's see what happens now if I move the anchor. So it moves the cube with it. So when you move the parent, so in this case, cube anchor is the parent and cube is the child. Moving the parent also moves the child. That doesn't just apply to movement, that also applies to rotation. So if I rotate this, you can see before that cube would rotate about the cube's center point. But because I'm rotating the parent, 
now it rotates around the parent. And we also will get different effects with scaling. So scaling, you know, generally be working the same, but before when it would scale, what would happen is it would scale from the center of the cube and it would grow in both directions. That's not happening now though. And what this lets me also do, if I return this back to one and just reset everything, and if I actually position the cube so that the cube is half a meter up in the air. And what that means is now when I do scaling, rather than before where it always grew in two directions, so it grew both up and down, now it just extends in one direction. And that's because what I've done is I've positioned it so the cube, the base of the cube is exactly at the point where the anchor is. So by parenting things, we can get some really cool results. Um, and this is an easy way for, you know, say you have a character and they have jumped onto a moving object and you want the character moving around safely on that object. You can parent the character to that object. And so now their movement is tied to it. So if you, you know, a player jumps onto a, uh, let's let's say it was a let's say it was a ship. If you parent then the player's character to the ship, then as the ship moves, the player will naturally move with it. You get that for free. Um, so hierarchy, making use of that is really important. We can remove stuff from the hierarchy just by dragging it out, or we can drag it back in. These can go really deep, so you can have as as deep as you want there with that. Uh, is something that's very, very easily doable. So, okay, we've got our cube. We've seen how we can place stuff in the scene. We've seen how we can move stuff around. Let's have a look at creating a little bit more than that. So I want to create a plane down the bottom here. Um, so this is going to be my ground. And the cube, I'm going to remove, leave the cube anchor there, but I am now going to just move the cube up a whole bunch. And oh, that's annoying. It's now gone out of view. So, okay. When I'm in this view here, if I right click and hold down the right mouse button, I can look around. When I'm in this view for looking around, so normally we were saying, you know, W goes to translation mode. While I've got the right mouse button held down, W will move me in whatever direction I'm facing. S will move me backwards. D will strafe right. A will strafe left. And I can also hold down shift to move faster. So you get your fairly standard uh, FPS on uh, a PC controls of WASD and shift to sprint. Now say I've held that down for way too long and I'm now way off over in the distance. I'm, I'm really far. I'm so far away from it. I can't even actually see it. That's okay. When you've got stuff here in the hierarchy, you can select it and I can double click on it and it zooms me back in over to it. Now, if I go way back over again, then the other thing I can do is I can pick something and I can press F. Uh, it will typically focus me on it. So F won't zoom you all the way in, but if you're near it, F will actually bring you closer. So we can kind of see that behavior again I'm over here. I'm going to go F and it will bring me back to it, but it won't uh, zoom me in. Uh, like double clicking will. So that's cool. I can see this and you know, that's pretty handy, but how does it actually look for this camera? What is the camera setting? So one thing I can do is I can click on the camera. That'll show me what the camera is actually able to see. The other thing I can do is I've got this tab here, game. So game shows you what the player would currently see based upon where that camera is placed. 
Uh, game view lets you do things like you can change your aspect. I usually will have this set to a particular aspect ratio so I know what I'm designing towards. Um, and so I can make sure things are being framed properly. So I usually will have an aspect ratio there, but when I'm testing how things scale with aspect, I'll often switch to free so that I can then mess around with that aspect ratio and make sure that it's working correctly. Uh, and when I'm in this view, I can actually play this. So the play button up here will start it. So the game's now playing. Now, Obviously nothing's going to be happening at the moment, but I can actually make changes while I'm playing. So, you know, I might not like the cube there. I'm going to bring that cube down. I'm going to rotate it a little bit. So it's like that. And I'm also going to scale it up a bit as well. So I can make all these changes and, you know, I can be at the point here like, ah, perfect, magnificent. It's the best uh, cube, not that it's really a cube anymore. It's the best box that I could be making in 3D there and it looks fantastic and this is great, ship it. And I'm like, okay, cool, that's all done. I'll stop and, oh, it reset. So you can make changes while the game is running, but those changes in many cases, and the majority of cases you'll encounter, don't get remembered. So that's something we need to watch for. What we can do is, you know, if I move this down, and again, you know, let's mess with the scale and everything. What I can do is I can come here and go, copy component or one, just one of the values. And then afterwards I could come back in and go paste component values. So there are ways we can bring stuff across. Uh, there are also some types of components that when you change them while it's running, those changes do actually get remembered. So there'll be a thing that we'll be looking at shortly called a material. And if you change those materials while the game is running, those changes are remembered. Those changes persist. Um, but while we're running, that's an important thing to be aware of. Any changes you do are typically going to be lost. But it can be really handy if you've got something where you're testing and you just want to quickly throw in a particular thing or change a value, you can do that while you're running. You can also pause it. So while it's running, we can hit pause and that will completely stop it. And then we can unpause it and then resume if, and stop it fully then if we want. But we want to have a little bit more happening than this. So let's start by, let's make the cube full. So to do that, we've got the cube selected. Now the cube already has a collider on it, which means it will, uh, you know, it actually has a, a physical, space that it's taking up and that it will interact with other things that are also taking up a physical space. So if I want it to be, you know, subject to gravity, if I type in rigid, so for 3D, so 3D and 2D physics does work slightly differently in Unity and there are different things you use for it. So we can see rigid body, I have a one that doesn't say anything after it and one that says 2D. So when you're working with physics things, if they don't say that they are 2D, then that means that they are 3D. So I would add a rigid body in this case. Now I could actually add a 2D rigid body. That would be fine. But the two physics systems don't generally interact. So 2D physics objects will only interact with other 2D physics ones. 3D only interacts with other 3D ones. So with this, I've told it that gravity's on. Uh, I can configure things like how much it weighs, it's sort of drag, things like that. But this will actually be enough. If I run it at this point, then the cube will fall. But it just stops. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, we kind of want it to do a little bit more than that. Maybe we want it to bounce. So if we want it to bounce, then what we're looking at is we're looking at having stuff. We can see the colliders. We've got this idea of a physics material. So again, nice organization of folders. I'm going to set up one here called physics materials. 
And then under this, I'm going to create, and then we can look through here. We've got physical material. So I'm going to call this, one is gonna be FizzMat Ground. And then I'm also going to, and I'm just gonna shrink the view here so I can just see the names of things. I'm gonna create another physics material. And this I'm going to call FizzMat Cube. So to attach these onto it, it's like select ground, and then I can just drag from ground over to the physics material option here. So that's one way I can set these. The other one, which you'll see if I select the cube, is select the cube and this little target symbol here. I can click on that and then that lets me select and I can select ones that are assets or things that are in the scene. So in most cases, it's assets that I'm looking for, so I can select the cube one. So now I can actually customize the behavior here. So we can see their bounciness is zero. So, okay, let's, let's try a bounciness of one on the cube and let's see what happens. So run that. You can see the cubes bouncing up and down a little bit. So that's pretty good. Uh, what happens if we make the ground bouncy as well? Maybe this is a cube that's hitting onto something that's fairly springy. Um, so we'll be able to see what changes with this. So see it bounces way higher. And while it's playing, we can actually go back to the scene view. Uh, and yeah, that's gonna tend to happen as well. So let's uh, start it back up again and we'll switch to the scene view and we can now watch the action that's happening here. And we can see, you know, what ends up happening is it tips a little bit and it just needs to tip that little bit and the bounciness just ends up knocking it flying. Uh, so we might lower the bounciness uh, of the ground just a little bit. Uh, so, okay, that's pretty cool. We've got our bouncing cube. There's one last little bit we want to make sure we do with this. And I want to set up a couple of materials. So materials control the appearance of things. So I'm going to create a material for the cube. And I'm also going to create a material for the ground. So the ground, to change the material there, I can drag this over. If I look in the mesh renderer, it will actually have uh, material there. So I could change that to this. The other way I can do this, and if we make sure we're able to see the cube, is I can drag this onto the object in the scene, or I can drag it onto it while it's in the hierarchy. Now, nothing actually immediately changes, but let's click on our materials and we can see they get populated in the inspector. Now, there's a lot of options here. Shader allows you to control a lot of how it processes the information. So changing the shader allows you to do things like have it be something that's affected by light or something that doesn't get affected by it. It allows you to do uh, various effects there with it. So shaders, there's so many things you can do with them. Um, for now, we're going to just stick with the standard shader. And what I can do is if I go click on albedo, I can change the color of this. And so I can make this, let's try and make it be vaguely, you know, green grassy looking. So that looks pretty good. I could also be applying textures. I can drag in a, a texture and image into this if I wanted it to actually have some patterning. Um, and there's a lot of things there. I could be turning on something called a mission. Uh, so if I wanted it to be, you know, and actually emitting really bright light, I could do that, but I'm going to turn that off um, and just keep it to, to this sort of setup. Uh, I can do similar with the cube, but the cube is one where I'm going to show you. So materials, we can change them while it is running. So I'm going to switch to the scene view. I've got the cube material selected and I want to make this cube a bit transparent. I'm going to make it a kind of transparent red. So I've set a red color and I wanna, I'm changing the transparency, but nothing's, nothing's actually changing. 
And the reason nothing is changing is because I need to switch this. Most things by default, their rendering mode is opaque. So it means that they don't support transparency. So I have to actually change this from opaque to transparent. And now I get a transparent cube. But I changed all this while I was playing, but it doesn't matter. Materials are one of the things that if you change a material while you are playing, it will actually modify that material. So a lot of things you do in the scene, changing those, it just resets. So scene things, so if anything that's in here, if you are changing it, it will generally reset. But if it is something where it's one of these assets and you're changing those, those will actually uh, remain. Those changes will persist across different, uh, you know, once you stop the game. So it's something we need to be cautious of. But now we've got our green plane, we've got our transparent cube, bounces down and eventually stops. Cool, so that is everything for this initial intro to Unity. So key things there. And I think I, I, think I should be a bit more full screen for this. Key thing there for, for this is you know, for getting set up with Unity, the tools and there. So that you'll be able to find all of those links, the links to Unity, the links to Visual Studio Code. Um, those are all in the description below. So grab those tools, get set up with them. And then in the next set of developer essentials videos, we're going to be starting to dive into more specific things. So we're going to be looking at the, a lot of stuff early on in terms of how we do scripting of basic things and how we work with these things that are in the hierarchy in code. Um, so grab Unity, experiment with all this stuff. Don't be afraid of things breaking, it doesn't matter. If it does, create a new project, that's okay. Just grab the tools and experiment with them. And that's gonna be a key thing I want folks to be doing and encourage folks to be doing uh, throughout with all of these videos. Practice the stuff afterwards. Try different things in the scene there. You know, we looked at cubes and planes, but I didn't any of the different ones. Don't worry about, you know, whether the, the it doesn't matter if it doesn't work perfectly or if it breaks or it looks horrible, that's okay. Find out what the stuff does. You've been, you know, you grab grab Unity, you've essentially got this new, new box that's got lots of dials and buttons and everything on it. Don't be afraid to turn any of the dials to hit any of the buttons. Hit all of them. Find out what they do by experimenting with it. And that's an approach I really want to encourage. Practice and experiment with the different things that we're looking at. It's going to be stuff that's really going to help you out with learning the things. And I really hope you've uh, found the video helpful and look forward to helping you out in further videos. Bye.